Thank you, everybody, for joining the general meeting this month. I appreciate it. Uh, I know July is a summer month. A lot of people are probably out vacationing or out doing things, having fun. Um, as a reminder, we have a POTA event this weekend at uh, Eldora, uh, Eldora uh, State Park. So if you're interested, um, drop me an email, and we're happy to tell you where it's at. You're welcome to come join us while we try to activate the park with the uh, club's go box. Um, also a reminder that Tuesdays and Thursday nights are our nets. Tuesday is the uh, Hamlet net for New Hams. Who'd like to join us? Starts at 7 p.m. Um, or 1900 for those of you who like that for 24 hour time. And on Tuesday night or Thursday nights at 8 p.m. 2000, we have the uh, general um, club ham uh, nets. So basically just a rag shoe and talk about stuff. We also have a couple of uh, breakfasts that are going on the second and fourth Tuesday of every month. Dick, KE0VT, hosts that one on Tuesdays and then on Saturdays usually as well. And Daryl showing off his, yeah, okay, good job, Daryl. Uh, Chuck, yeah, okay, hey, thank you. Chuck, <laughs> yes, Dick Kat. has canceled the rest of the meetings out in Firestone until fall. Okay. So the Tuesday ones we're going to hold off on. Uh, this will be also the last POTA event uh, until probably in the fall as well. Um, part of it is just scheduling uh, for myself, for other people who want to help run it. So um, we'll try to kick those off again, hopefully in uh, September. As a reminder as well, and I haven't put it on the calendar yet and put it on the website, but the Northern Colorado Amateur Radio Club has invited us to their picnic in September. Uh, and I will get the date and location out to everybody. So uh, come out, mingle. Uh, they'll have burgers and things like that. And on August 14th, we have our radio in the park. And we will be doing burgers and dogs as well. So come on out, try to make some contacts, get on the go box. Um, and I've also, the board has decided to invite NCART to that as well. So hopefully there'll be some mingling of uh, different clubs there as well. So we have an opportunity to talk to some of those folks from up there. Uh, some of them are members of our club as well. Uh, I know Joe, uh, who's the board president, is a member of our club. I'm a member of their club. Uh, I try to make their club meetings as much as possible, things like that. So, And Doug joined us. So, Doug, where's the uh, radio in the park? Which park is that? Thompson Park. Thompson Park in Longmont. And then also, was it August? what's the date for the uh, parade? August 14th. No, the parade's August 7th. Okay. Yeah, and you still... Go ahead. Yeah. Mark Molinauer organizes a number of our activities. He's going to be organizing the parade uh, support. And uh, I'll be sending out an email pretty soon <clears throat> requesting uh, people to volunteer. We need six to eight people uh, with an HT. And uh, we station ourselves around the uh, parade route. Uh, we help the uh, floats get organized and uh, get on the parade route in the proper sequence as well. So uh, the, the, the parade starts at like 10 in the morning. It's over by 1130 usually. The, uh, we gather between 830 and 9 on the Saturday morning. And, uh, and so uh, if anybody wants to volunteer, if anybody's new this time, a time of activity, why then I have a set of instructions I will send out to you if you've never uh, uh, worked on a closed controlled net before. So that's about it. All right, thank you, Doug. And we do provide uh, safety vests as well, so, so you don't yep. get run over by people. Yep. And, and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of it's a great learning experience. <clears throat> and uh, I've done the um, Christmas lights parade a couple years. Um, so it's, it, it, the the fair parade is a lot warmer than the Christmas light parade. So that's a, probably a little bit better one to do if uh, if you don't want to freeze. <laughs> so. 
but they're all a lot of fun. So come out and join us and uh, sign up if you've never done it before and get some good experience. Does any other board member have anything they'd like to bring up? Could I get Let's say I've got a couple things. Okay. Go ahead, Brian. Okay. Uh, we had a V session this past weekend. Uh, it was very successful. Everyone passed what they came for. Wound up with nine new technicians, uh, one renewed extra, and one upgrade from tech to general. So be on the lookout for any new call signs on the repeater. Might be people trying to make their first contacts. Our next scheduled test session is August 28th. It is an ARRL session, so there will be the $15 fee to test. Uh, there has been some Facebook messages going around for some reason, evidently some people thought that the $35 fee from the FCC had been implemented yet. Uh, it still has not, so uh, you can still get in under that. Uh, also, a previous test candidate brought in a flyer to this test session. He's trying to sell his uh, Kenwood two meter, 70 centimeter station uh, he's going back to Germany and wants to get rid of it. I put a posting on the LARC bulletin board system, which is at larkbbs.org in the items to buy or trade section, if anyone's interested in that. And uh, that's all I've got. Brian? Thank you, Brian. Yes. Brian, you say a renewed extra. I don't understand. Isn't that? Oh, yeah, he, he was an extra, and then his license expired. And it had expired for you know three years ago or something. So uh, the FCC has rules in place now that they can come in and take the technician exam, and if they pass it, they'll get their extra back. Hmm. Uh, same for extra and general if they're expired. Oh. Okay, thanks. Sure. All right, Pat, did you have something? I ask for Ed Bennett's uh, call sign. Okay, can you see me? I can see your your handle. That's all. E Bennett, nineteen forty five. Okay, let me. I'm sorry. Let's. Uh, oh, there we are. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay, let me. It's K E zero A H G. A H G. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I have to put that in there. <laughs> okay, you have to shorten your name. Any other board member have anything they'd like to bring up? All right. Uh, any members of the club that have any announcements really quick? And then, and then we'll get started on the presentation. Uh, oh, one more quick thing. Uh, I don't know if you want to say anything, Dick, or not, but uh, Dick, is, Dick is looking for volunteers to help with the uh, LARC Fest for next year. So please contact him if you're interested in helping with uh, LARC Fest next year. Uh, it's usually the first Saturday in April at the Boulder County Fairgrounds. So get a hold of him, and uh, he's our coordinator for that, and uh, he'll put you to work. That's going to be April 5th. April 5th, gotcha. Yep. And I got confirmation from Rebecca that we're scheduled for that. Thank you. So uh, i just like to remind everybody that uh, we're still having – Breakfasts on Saturday, the Hidden Cafe, 8 o'clock, uh, basically 9th and Main. And uh, we've been getting seven or so people turn out, sometimes eight. We have room for some more, so come on over. It's a lot of fun. All right. Thank you, Dick. Anybody got anything else? <clears throat> All right, Chris, if you'd like to introduce yourself and uh, the we, we have your, you have our attention. How about that? <laughs> okay. Well, I got my um, general back in, I think February and March, and this was the year I was going to retire. So I was like, oh, I'm going to have all this time. I need to, you know, make sure I get my um, ham radio license mm -hmm. so that I can start learning about all, all of the stuff that hams do. I work with a guy who's been a ham for years and years, and he keeps encouraging me to get on since I'm a radio scientist. So I went for the plunge. And since then, it's been nothing but one thing after another. And I've gotten on the nets a couple times, um, but I really would like to do more. 
But when I first joined, I told Kat that I would be more than happy to tell you guys what I do um, and to do a presentation for you guys. So that's kind of what I'm going to do tonight. And I'm going to share my screen. And I don't know how much you hams know about you know, the, the licensing and stuff. So I'm going to go very simple. And again, if you guys have any questions, I won't be able to see your hands, but um, we can talk maybe after too. Well, and I, I made you a co-host, Chris, so you should be able to okay. share your screen. And also usually at the end, if you want, we can do a Q&A or I have a chat window up as well. If people want to ask questions to the chat window, I'll, I can relay those as well. Okay. So can you guys see this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, let me see here. Whoops. It's not in presentation mode, but I see it. Yeah, let me see if I can do that real quick. How's that? There we go. Yeah, I definitely can see it. All right. So um, kind of my outline of my talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am. I'm going to talk a little bit about the radio spectrum. I'm going to talk about sharing spectrum and why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm going to talk about my measurement system. I'm going to talk about some propagation models. I'm going to show you some terrain profiles and databases. I'm going to show you my measured data and what I get out of my measured data. And then I just thought it might be fun for you guys to see some measured spectrum that we did in Denver um, in the VHF and UHF bands uh, back in 2015 or 2016. It's, you know, probably all changed since then, but I just, you know, sometimes people like to see that. So I am new to ham radio, <clears throat> but I've been, um, I've been in the federal government for 30 plus years. Uh, I started out in, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. It was the old NBS for you guys that are a little bit older. <laughs> and then I switched over to the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences and I've been there for 10 plus years. Um, that is under the Department of Commerce and the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Um, I've worked in the areas of radio propagation and modeling. That's kind of what I do right now. I worked in time domain free field research. Um, we actually did a lot of um, electromagnetic shielding measurements. One of them included the Space Shuttle Endeavor. That's where I met my current husband. Uh, we've also done composite aircraft and Boeing 737s, um, where you put a transmitter on the inside and then you see what comes out of the aircraft and then you can get a shielding number. I worked in the electromagnetic properties of materials, just measuring materials such as those that you find in um, boards like cell phone boards and stuff. And then I also worked in the area of noise metrology. Um, and I would love to be a part of emer emergency communications. That's kind of why I joined the ham radio so that I could be a part of that and um, um, you know, learn about how that all takes place. So, um, so the radio spectrum, I don't know if you guys know, but the Federal Communications Commission, this is their mission statement. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can read it, and I can send this presentation to Kat. Uh, but they are responsible for commercial regulations and commercial licensing. NTIA is the executive branch agency in the federal government, and they're responsible for licensing all federal entities, uh, DOD, Army, Navy, all of those people go through NTIA. And ITS, our mission is to advance the innovation in communications technology. We do spectrum measurements. We build systems to measure different types of radio signals. And we do a lot of investigation. If there is a, a claim of interference or something, we'll go down and we'll find out what's going on with that. Um, I did put our website down there, its.boulderdoc.gov. If you guys like to read papers about propagation or radio measurements, um, Navy radars, all everything, go there, look under the publications and type something up. Uh, ITS has been around for 50 plus years. So there are a lot of papers and they've kept all of them. 
And some of the spectrum measurements that I did are also in there. And then some of the papers that I wrote on, on some of my measurements are also included in that long list of papers. So do you guys recognize this? Do you guys know what the United States of Frequency Allocations are? Oh, Just yeah. Raise your hand. OK. So everything's divided up right now, right? So I have some little boxes here where this is where the amateur radio is down um, on between 300 kilohertz and three megahertz, right? And then you guys also have some amateur radios licenses up here. Anywhere there's green here is where amateur radio exists. Um, the green here is for um, commercial spectrum for you guys only. So feds can't just go in there and use your spectrum. The red is for federal government. So anywhere you see red on the bottom here, that's strictly federal government licensing. And um, then the black is a shared spectrum. And anytime you see a, I know this is hard to see, but you guys can take a look at this. Anytime you see something in capital letters, that means it has primary access to that spectrum. Anything in lowercase um, letters means that it is subordinate to that primary user. So you can't just go in there and use those frequencies. You have to listen first or talk first, or not talk first, but listen first. If it's available, then you can go in. And you can see that the spectrum is really, really crowded um, at some of these higher frequencies. And also um, some of the federal government has large swaths of um, spectrum that they use. Well, um, the radio spectrum is a limited resource that you know. It's confined by space, time, frequency, um, polarization, uh, whatever you guys use in your ham radio, that's where it's confined to. Well, the wireless carriers, they own spectrum from 1710 to 1755 megahertz and then from 1850 to 1910 megahertz. And the government is smack dab in the middle of that. They own spectrum from 1755 to 1850 megahertz. They have a lot of classified, um, uh, what do I wanna say? Um, you know, like uh, surveillance or, you know, things that they use in that spectrum. Well, the wireless carriers decided that they wanted to go in and get some of that federal spectrum so that they could have a continuous piece of spectrum that they could aggregate. Well, the federal government has, you know how slowly the wheels of federal government turn. And some of these are radar systems that have been in there for a long time or um, communications, um, radio communications that the technology you don't just go out and earn money and go buy something new, right? You have to get a grant with the federal government. Um, there is a lot of steps you have to take. And believe me, it's horrendous. It is so muddled right now. It's really hard to get instrumentation or to change instrumentation. So they, the federal government worked with the wireless carriers to start sharing that spectrum. <clears throat> and that's where we came in. So we conducted several spectrum surveys and I heard you guys talking about Eglin Air Force Base. We went down there and we measured some of the spectrum in some of those, um, uh, for some of those communication channels. And we showed that in various locations that the government was not fully utilizing their spectrum. Imagine that. And you know they went to the wireless carriers and they said, we're using it 24 seven all day long, all weekend long. And lo and behold, they weren't. Um, and so let me just show you this. So this is a spectrum from 1750 to 1850. This is government spectrum. And this was actually taken in Chicago, Illinois. And I know, or Illinois, and I know there's not a lot of um, government entities up there, but this is pretty much what happens all the time in government spectrum. If you look between these two frequency bands, in some of those reports, I um, we did measurements in Denver, we did measurements in San Diego. Uh, let's see where else. Um, I think there was another location, but it it slips my mind. Um, but we 
showed that the government could actually use less of this spectrum. And so what we did is we partnered with the federal or with the DOD or the, uh, the Defense Spectrum Organization. And they are trying to work out a plan where they could share this spectrum. Um, actually, some of the government entities are now vacating this um, spectrum. Um, they have 10 years to move out of the band to figure out how to coexist with these wireless carriers. And these are um, uplink frequencies. So when you use your cell phone, you're using uplink frequencies in this part of the band. Um, and so they can interfere with some of the government um, entities that exist in this area or for flights or um, communication between flights, um, that type of thing. And so um, this signal can propagate for a long way if it's in free space. And so what we came in and we did is uh, let me back up. So when they first started working together, they did this study and they used these propagation models that showed that <clears throat> um, there were terrain obstructions, uh, but they didn't have any what I call clutter. And that's the attenuation due to buildings or trees when you're measuring. And so they decided that they would go back and they would refine, the DOD would go back and refine their clutter measurement analysis. And that's how we got to work with them. Um, so we're currently measuring radio propagation and then we pull out clutter. So we go to areas like urban areas. We've been to North Carolina, which is heavily forested. Signals don't propagate very well there. Uh, and so that was kind of my mission, and I've been doing this since about 2015, we put this system together. So let me talk a little bit. So I have this little animation. You guys have seen this, but you know, what we do is we have a transmitting antenna and it propagates out and then we have a receiving antenna. Well, if we output a pow power of 10 watts, then before if at this position, the losses due to free space are like 10 to the minus six watts, right? Well, if you go back and um, you look at what the attenuation through a building is, then you, you get one times 10 to the minus nine watts. So you're 30 dB below what you would get in free space typically if you're propagating around a building. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of what we're trying to measure is what is that attenuation and then help DOD come up with a propagation model that includes the effects of building and, and foliage. So we have a mobile channel measurement system. It's just a simple fixed um, transmitter to mobile receiver architecture. We do single frequency because it's very complicated to set up a system <clears throat> that will measure broadband. And we transmit at a fixed location. Our receiver is located on our mobile platform. That's typically a van. And I'll show you um, pictures of that van. And we move around a prescribed route. So we go out, we look at it, we do a site survey. Um, we tell the DOD we can measure here and here and here. And then they refine the route. Um, so they get what they want out of the measurement. And this system has been implemented um, by ITS for both outdoor mobile and indoor building environments. So this has actually been used um, in a thesis at CU Boulder for doing indoor building environments. So these are our measurement vehicles. In the upper left hand corner is our receiving van. It's a green van, just a very generic van. We have the antenna on the back of the van on a mast. So that ma mast can go up to 25 feet in height if we wanted to use that. We don't, of course, we don't, you know, extend the mast when we're driving around. So the height of that receiving antenna is about three meters. Uh, we've done all of the antenna characterization. We have a turntable at um, Table Mountain. I don't know if you guys know that location, but it's up just north of Boulder. It's owned by, um, the federal government. <clears throat> and so we've characterized that whole thing. <clears throat> In the lower left corner, excuse me, let me get a drink. 
I apologize. <clears throat> In the lower left corner is our transmitting truck. This is our what we call old blue. Um, she's been around for a long time, but she has three masts and all the equipment goes inside. It's air conditioned. Um, we can do, I've done measure, spectrum measurements for a couple weeks in that thing, and it has a diesel generator, which lasts about that long, so it's really nice. In that particular pic picture, we had been doing, um, during the um, All-Star game, not All-Star, um, the SEC championship, when it was at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, we were measuring the aggregated um, signals that came out of that building using this particular truck. And if you notice, I don't know if you can see my ma uh, my mouse here, but this is a panel antenna that <clears throat> has a very narrow um, beam width, but uh, it, can, it, it it's a very fine tuned system to measure all of this aggregate power. And then <clears throat> here uh, we have a cellular on wheels as well. This mast height extends up to 60 feet and you'll see this little antenna on top. And I'll, I'll tell you the specs of these antennas here in a minute. But we actually went out to Los Angeles and placed this up in Griffith Park. And then we measured around the Hollywood area down into downtown Los Angeles. <clears throat> and we did several measurements there. Um, so on the transmitting side, <clears throat> we have a signal generator. And um, this is disciplined by a rubidium oscillator so that we get very good frequency synchronization between our transmitting side and our receiving side. The power amplifier is a 60 watt power amplifier. Um, we don't use all that power because um, we did some measurements and actually the linear range, um, we have to input um, minus four into that power amplifier. We go into non our nonlinear range. That signal is then fed through a high power directional coupler into part of it goes into a power meter so we can make sure that the transmitting level maintains some um, uh, within some uncertainty. And then um, that signal is fed into the antenna. <clears throat> so the omnidirectional antenna is a stacked dipole. It has eight dBi of gain. It's vertically polarized for these measurements. And it is narrow band. It's designed specifically for this set of frequencies. On the receiving side, um, we have an omnidirectional receiving antenna with about two dBi gain. Uh, it's a very broad band. It goes 300 megahertz to 10 gigahertz. And it also is vertically polarized for these types of measurements. Uh, we do have a RF filter because um, this is very this uh, band is next to the high powered wireless carrier band, so we want to make sure we have as low noise floor as possible. Um, <clears throat> we haven't implemented an amplifier which would give us a pre selector at this point, um, just because we have a really good noise floor in this measurement system. The signal is fed into a power divider. It's fed both to a PXA and a spectrum analyzer, and I'll tell you why in just a second. And then these two instruments are also uh, rubidium disciplined. And we have a power supply that actually will tune the rubidiums to each other from the transmitter and receiver side. So the PXA <clears throat> um, is the most accurate piece of equipment in our suite. It has a noise floor that's about 10 dB lower than our spectrum analyzer. So we use that for, and it measures IQ data. So we use that for, um, <clears throat> for our main measurement instrument. But once you put that into a mode where you start measuring I and Q, you can't see the display. The display goes away. So we needed something like a spectrum analyzer to let us know if the power failed, if the transmitter kicked off, um, if there were some anomalies in the measurement. So that's why we've included the spectrum analyzer. The PXA also doesn't have any geolocation. So we take the <clears throat> GPS signal from the spectrum analyzer. We actually um, match the signals between the PXA and the spectrum analyzer. And then we transfer the GPS coordinates from the spectrum analyzer to the PXA measurements. And then we have a computer that does, that collects all that data and processes it. 
And we do use a, uh, let's see, mm, I got all that, Never mind. Okay. So as you guys probably know, there's lots of propagation models. There's free space loss, which you know is anything without buildings, terrain, whatever. There's the Longley Rice irregular terrain model, which was actually developed at ITS um, in the 1950s and 1960s, but it um, only accounts for terrain. And I'll show you a little bit of that. The terrain integrated rough earth model or TIRM is a DOD model and it's very similar to ITM. There's Okamura Hata, cost 231 and many, many others. Um, Okamura Hata and cost 231 try to take into account the clutter um, that they saw in Tokyo, Japan, which is not like the clutter that we see here. So we're trying to refine those clutter models. Um, so the irregular terrain model needs terrain elevation data in order to make estimates, estimates of the losses in the presence of terrain. So the most common terrain databases are the SRTM or the Shuttle Radar Topography Mission. It's got a 30 meter and a 90 meter resolution. Um, <clears throat> the NED is a USGS digital elevation model. Sometimes it's taken from the cartographic information, and sometimes it's um, taken from the stereographic information. Um, uh, they are trying to refine it now, and they do now have included LIDAR into some of this NED data, and that's light detection and ranging. It does show the reflection from trees and buildings, and we are hoping that we can actually use some of that information to develop a clutter model out of that. And it's got very good resolution, one meter resolution. Uh, here are some terrain profiles just to show you the difference between each of these um, different terrain databases. So the USGS NED, this is a 30 meter resolution. So data is taken every 30 meters and plotted. The um, red dotted line is the um, free space link between transmitter and receiver. If there was no terrain in the, in, <coughs> excuse me, in the path, then you would measure the, the free space path loss. You can see the SRTM, it doesn't have the bumps that you see in USGS NED. And part of this data, um, actually, because it was like a, a SARS measurement where it had stereoscopic, it actually measures the top of the tree line. So it doesn't actually tell you what the ground level is. Um, there have There is some, um, SRTM files now where they've actually taken out the treetops and they actually will give you the um, baseline. But this is something that you could just pull off the internet. And if you didn't know any better, it would give you the wrong answer. Um, here's a LIDAR 30 meter um, database. So <clears throat> also the axis, I'm sorry, um, elevation versus distance. So our transmitter sits up here and our receiver is down here. And the LIDAR looks very similar to the USGS NED. They've done a lot of work on pulling out the bare earth elevation data. And then LIDAR 10 meters, I thought maybe that might give us some advantage, but in these particular instances, it really doesn't. Um, I've marked some dominant features. So as this little piece of the terrain goes up into, goes up past this red line, that's where ITM picks off losses. Um, so it'll assign some losses due to that little peak there and then also down here. And in this particular, um, let me move this out of the way. In this particular, um, <clears throat> these are all the same point, but in SRTM, you would be predicting free space path loss when there is actually some terrain diffraction loss. And here at LIDAR2, um, you would be predicting a little bit of attenuation, but not as much as if, if you were using this particular database. So databases are very important when you're looking at um, terrain 
effects and terrain losses in propagation models. So be, you have to be very careful in using them. This is a LIDAR profile. And this was taken in Longmont. I thought you guys might like to know since you guys are in Longmont. So we uh, placed our antenna, our transmitting antenna on the top of Table Mountain at the very edge. And we had a receiver that was driving around in Longmont. And then the green are the buildings and trees that LIDAR is picking up. And then the um, USGS and bare earth uh, LIDAR is down here at the bottom. And sometimes you'll see a little bit of red, sometimes you'll see a little bit of black. So they don't match exactly, but they're pretty close. This is actually um, an elevation map in Longmont. I don't know if when you're driving around Longmont, if you notice that toward the eastern part of Longmont, you go up over hills. And on the western part of Longmont, you start approaching Table Mountain and some of the hilly areas out here. But there's a big bowl here in the center. And I was trying to understand uh, the losses that we were getting when we took measurements. And so I had to plot this to kind of understand um, why we weren't seeing certain, um, uh, why we were seeing more losses than what, what some of the terrain databases have predicted. <clears throat> so this is typically what we um, come up with when we do a, a drive test. Now, this particular building my colleague always says reminds him of a Yagi antenna. Um, I think it was kind of designed that way. That's that's our building. That's um, ITS is in this wing right here, and we placed a transmitter on the top of the building, and then we drove around this part of Boulder, and then up the hill to Ankar, and then back down through all the neighborhoods. And so I call this neighborhood Martin Acres. Um, and you'll see that closest to the antenna, you get the red hot numbers. That means you have more signal. As you drive out, you uh, this area of, of Boulder has a lot of one story homes and trees. And so as you drive out, you'll see that you get more attenuation as you drive further out from this transmitting antenna. And then over here, this is a similar neighborhood, but there's a diffraction ridge. Whoops. Whoop. There's a diffraction ridge between the transmitting antenna and this neighborhood. And we also have, this is up on Green Mountain, which is a lot higher. And we placed a transmitter up there. And when your transmitter's up here, you don't see the diffraction ridge. So you get a lot more signal level over here. So we were trying to understand clutter losses and high antennas versus low antennas. And that's why we were doing these measurements. And the number is just the measurement point. So it doesn't really mean anything. Um, the dark blue, of course, is the lowest signal level. So that diffraction ridge really blocks you. But once you get out of that ridge, then you start picking up signal level again. And we're climbing up the hill to NCAR at this point. And right here is where we can see directly back to the transmitter. And that's why the signal levels are so high. Um, so this is the result of that measurement. So um, the blue. So we're plotting basic transmission gain. And that's just the, I, I use gain because loss confuses me. And I like to see you know, the difference between the lowest signal levels and the highest signal levels at the top. So that's why I plotted it this way. But the blue is the measured data. <clears throat> and um, so we're driving along Martin Acres neighborhood. You can see that the signal level gets less and then it starts climbing again. We have a very high signal level here where we're back on the road and we're, we can see directly back to the transmitter. And then we come over to the Drexel Claremont neighborhood and um, uh, we have very low signal levels there as depicted in that, that slide before. And then we climb up the NCAR hill, we drive around and we lose signal and gain signal. And then we come back down, we lose a little signals, we're driving back to our um, to the, the labs. And then as we approach the transmitter, then we start, our signal starts climbing again. The um, red 
um, dots here are what ITM would predict for this particular measurement. So here, um, <clears throat> the, the green dotted line is free space. If you had free space all the way, um, our measurement should approach this line here. And so for this first part of the run, you see that ITM actually predicts free space path loss. So because there's that, that tells us there's no terrain here that impacts our measurements. So the clutter losses that we get from buildings and trees are what I call this value here. The ITM model minus our measured data gives us the amount of clutter losses. So here you can see that's about 30 dB in that particular area of Boulder. Now here we have this diffraction ridge that crops up and you can see that ITM predicts a lot more losses due to the diffraction ridge. And so these, the difference between free space and ITM is now our diffraction losses. And I call these losses clutter losses. So you see a little bit of clutter here but you don't see all of the, uh, you don't see a, as much clutter loss here as you saw here because of that ridge. And then there are areas where terrain again becomes um, a problem here as we drive up around NCAR and we're shielded. And then we get free space as we drive back toward the transmitter. So that's what's going on in this particular um, plot. So when we take, when we do clutter losses, then we take all those numbers that were on that slide and we give this to the DOD. So in the Martin Acres neighborhood, our clutter losses had a mean of 30.40B and a median of about 30.40B. And that's because there were no terrain um, losses in that particular area. And then in the Drexel Claremont neighborhood, because we have more diffraction losses, then our mean goes down for clutter <clears throat> and our st standard deviation becomes bigger. So I just plot probability versus the clutter loss off of that, that chart that I just showed you. So now we get to the fun part. This is measured Denver spectrum. And you can see up here at the top, I have the frequency 144, 146 and 148. You can see the amateur band is also from 144 to 146. In Denver, it's shared between amateur and amateur satellite. There's a lot of activity that's going on in here. And let me just explain this plot. Um, <clears throat> the blue is the maximum signal, signal that we detected. The black I, I know this plot is busy and I'm sorry. I'll, I'll try and go through it slowly. The black is the mean signal level that we detected during that amount of time. The green is the median. The red is the minimum signal level. And then the pink is our mean system noise floor of that particular measurement system. And <clears throat> although we measure um, these in voltage, uh, we do convert everything to field strength, dB microvolts per meter, because that's typically what people use. So the frequencies down along this axis, um, there's a fixed mobile band above the amateur band and a fixed mobile band below the amateur band. And I believe those are typically government bands. Um, um, but it's been a long time since I've reviewed this data, but uh, the reports that I talked about earlier, if you go to that ITS website, you can pull these reports up and it gives you everything you ever wanted to know about each of these bands, who uses them, what they're used for, <clears throat> that type of thing. In this second plot here, this is actually a time versus frequency. So these are when the signals came off and when they came on, came on, came off. Um, <clears throat> here you see signals that were there continuously or pretty much continuously. And these measurements, uh, the time is in minutes. So we're talking about a couple of weeks that we spent in, in Denver. Where you see red, that's a strong signal level. <clears throat> the lowest signal levels are in dark blue. And then you see a lot of um, signals, like I said, that came on and came off. So that's how you interpret that one. Whoops. 
And then in the bottom here, this actually tells you the amount of time that a signal was on. So this blue, dark blue, the signal was on about 0.09% of the time. These signals down here in the red, these were on for a really, really long time, 96.18% of the time. And then we just picked a threshold to do some statistics on this particular um, plot. So that's the VHF spectrum. <clears throat> and then the UHF, UHF spectrum is actually um, radio location or what you would call radar is the, the primary um, licensee in this band with amateur being secondary. And you can see that some of these signals were on for a continual amount of time. Um, I believe these are probably amateur. Um, and there's not much activity down here in the 420 to 432 band. So let's see, I think that's about all I have. I do have, oh, let's see. Um, this is a really busy band, um, 440, oh, okay, this was the second half of this one. So this went to 420 to 444, and this one went from 444 to 468, just so you can kind of see how busy some of these bands really do get. You get a lot of strong signals down here that are on for a long time. And you can see that this band has a lot more continuous use signals um, than the previous bands. Um, I think that's about it. I do have some other terrain database information if you guys want to kind of look at some cartographic stuff, but uh, as far as that's, that's my presentation. So I can go on or you can ask questions. Well, thank you, Chris. Does anybody have any questions? I, I'm, I'm curious. Or when you did the thing in Boulder, was that requested by somebody or you did that as a test or what exactly to get the data? Uh, so we were beginning to use that system. And so we wanted to understand it. We were trying to define what's important, what's not important. Like, uh, is the speed of the vehicle important? Is the, um, uh, the height of the antenna important? Um, what about the clutter environment? What can that tell us about the signal level and where it's propagating? So we were actually studying the system intently. Um, I have a best practices measurement document that I went through and it talks about how you should really go through your system to understand it, make sure it's working correctly before you ever put data out into the community. Because some of this data, you don't know how it was taken what the noise floor was, you know, if it's valid. And so we really wanted to document our system. And that that measurement was for us internally so that we could understand more of what's going on there. Now, we did recently drive all over Boulder and into Longmont uh, for our sponsor. And that was more, um, we're now in this phase where they want to characterize how many cell phones are emitting and how strong the signal levels are at a particular place. And will that impact the government entity that's flying around or the guys on the ground or that type of thing. So we have done more extensive measurements in Longmont. And that first measurement I did in Longmont that I showed you, uh, we drove all around Longmont, really characterized that really well. And we drove around cell phone towers so they could get clutter estimates of um, <clears throat> um, signals around the cell towers because you know your cell phone just connects to a cell tower so they wanted to understand that clutter as opposed to the clutter that a government entity might see a long way away okay cool and uh, it looks like will's got a question will go ahead you can unmute yourself if you haven't already yeah um i was just curious the the sampled spectrum information you showed from the Denver area, you know, you, you, you showed some um, bands that us amateurs are familiar with. When you took that data, was it taken over a whole wide range of frequencies? 
beyond what you've shown us? And is that like in some of those reports? Oh, yeah. That, yeah, we measured the spectrum from, I think, 100 megahertz to 10 gigahertz. And there's all kinds of signals that we measured. We did radar measurements. We did... Um, uh, we did some cell towers, although it wasn't as predominant as it is now. Um, for various types of signals, oh, we did microwave links. Um, let's see what else. And yeah, everything's in that report. So it goes through the FCC description of what's in that band, who uses that band. And right now that might be outdated, but yeah, it's a huge, I think it's like, 150 to 200 pages that document and it you know it describes the measurement if you're doing a radar what's the best way to do a radar measurement um we do a uh, random sampling so we when we did these measurements we would measure a specific band for a certain amount of time then we would switch to another band and we tried to formulate that based on what we knew about what was going on in that band and who was using that band. So does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So there's, so there's, so there's a big report out there on measured spectrum data that you've taken. Yeah. Um, and, and we did this a long time ago. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm talking 2012, 2013, 2015, I think. Um, so things could change, but basically the bands haven't changed that much. You know, government moves very slowly, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> well, they, they took part. They took part of ours. Uh, what was it early last year? Oh, the, the three megahertz. Band? Yeah, the three megahertz. Yeah. I believe it was. Uh, I got a question in the chat for you, Chris. Um, did you have anything else, Will? Sorry. No, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, question is: Does the cellular carriers and the land mobile? suppliers must have their version of this data that they use for planning cell tower placement, public safety repeaters, et cetera. Do they use their own data collection or do they use yours? Um, well, they, they use some of ours, but basically um, they go out and they do all, they've done these, I mean, they've done cellular measurements for years, right? I mean, they started out um, when cellular wasn't cellular. And so they've got a whole database of, of measurements that they've taken. They have their own propagation models. It's all proprietary though. And kind of what ITS wants to do, it, it wants to be the honest broker. So it wants to be able, our information is always public, right? <clears throat> And so we want to be the ones that go out and say, this is the way we think you should do the measurement. Um, this is why, and this is what we got so that they can come to the table and they can see what they've done as opposed to what we've done. Okay. And then uh, Roger, you have a question? Oh, yes, your thank you. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, I'm really interested in uh, the antennas that you use and uh, I'm sure these systems are really well crafted and uh, calibrated when you put them together. How do you go about uh, dealing with the antenna, things like directivity and uh, dealing with um, properties of antennas when you make these measurements? So <clears throat> when we first started these measurements, there was a group of people that went out to San Diego and they set up an antenna. It was very near um, some metal structures. And so their GPS was slightly off and it threw the antenna pattern. They had a directional antenna and it threw the antenna pattern out of, of, of where they were driving. So they were, as you know, a directional antenna falls off very rapidly on the edges, right? So if you don't know exactly where you are and you try and apply an antenna correction, you could be way off. And that's what we were seeing. We were seeing the effects of the antenna um, um, in both the um, azimuth and the elevation. Well, we decided that we didn't want to worry about the azimuth part of it. So we opted for an omni antenna. 
that will throw energy out all over the place. And so we can see what's actually reflected back into the antenna because we did some measurements that showed that if you use an omnidirectional antenna, you're near a mountain, you could pick up those reflections in your antenna as you drive out in Boulder. So we wanted to make sure that we got all of the um, uh, signal level that we could. Um, the elevation, we actually characterized it on that turntable and we did repeated measurements. So we know the uncertainty as we apply the correction in the elevation of the antenna. Uh, we did very careful studies on that. So we correct our antenna gain only in the elevation direction. And we don't worry so much about the azimuth, although <clears throat> you know it can vary based on the vehicle and where you place your antenna on the vehicle, but we know that uncertainty and that's in our uncertainty budget. Is that yeah, thank your, you. answer That's your question? Okay. Yes, thank you very much. And then uh, Brian, AF0W has got a couple of questions as well. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, first off, thanks for doing the presentation. It's been really interesting. It's good. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned the uh, system noise and stuff in your measurement system, but do you guys do any characterization of just the noise floor in general? You know, over time, as far as you know, all these we hear about these consumer devices that come in from China and stuff and cause a lot of RFI and stuff like that. There, yeah. Uh, is yeah. that anything you guys uh, deal with or not really? <clears throat> well, NIST does that. So NIST characterizes noise. We do, um, when we were developing this system, we always take a, we turn off the transmitter and we always take a noise floor measurement because I think it's very important to see how that changes over time. Um, we don't have to worry about the noise floor so much up, up at the frequencies where we are, um, 1750 megahertz. You have, you're more concerned with the one over F roll off on the bottom end of the spectrum. And that has been characterized. Uh, ITS does have some reports. There was someone that did a lot of noise measurements in the Denver area or a number of people. And those are out there. So I think there's a search thing on there that you could go look at noise and you could see how the noise level has changed over time as you know cars came into being and uh, cell phone emissions came in and that type of thing. So those reports are out there, but we don't specifically do that so much anymore. Um, we're in kind of chaos right now because of COVID and um, it's very chaotic where I am right now. That's kind of why I'm retiring. It's I've had enough of federal government, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the other question, you mentioned uh, Table Mountain and having a turntable to characterize uh, antenna systems. What other sort of things do they do up there? <clears throat> um, there are a number of agencies that, well, actually, um, we partner with some people. They sign what's called a CRADA or a cooperative research agreement with the Department of Commerce. And so Lockheed Martin's out there, they do um, laser testing, laser, laser range finding and that type of thing. There's people that use drones that go out there and look at drone activity and um, make measurements with drones. The USGS has a place out there. Um, they also measure the, the gravimetric, um, you know, um, they're changing the geoid of the earth. And so they're doing gravimetric measurements to see how that changes over time. So they're doing some really sensitive measurements out there. Um, let's see, who else is out there? We do a lot of radar testing out there. Right now, um, NOAA's out there. They're worried about um, cellular phones getting into their systems. And so they're doing a lot of measurements out there right now. Um, people can come in and use it, not regular people, you have to have a sponsor, but people do come in and they request to come into Table Mountain and do those types of measurements. Um, there's army personnel that come out there and do measurements. So um, it's, it's, if you drive along um, US 36 and you come to Plateau Road, um, Plateau Road is the beginning of Table Mountain. It's a it's a pretty high tabletop mountain out there. You can't miss it. And I think if you go along Nelson Road, um, Nelson Road skirts the the northern part of that mountain. 
and you'll see it has government signs on it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't realize that was actually one of the, the nationwide radio quiet zones. One of our students in one of our classes mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have done spectrum measurements out there. It's not kind of as quiet as we would like it. It's not like the one in, where is it, Pennsylvania, I think. But we do try and keep the levels kind of low out there so people can do measurements across the frequency bands. I got a couple more questions here for you. Uh, Mark, I got one question and then uh, we'll get to you. So as you measure attenuation, what about multipaths? Does it affect your accuracy? Are you able to measure multipath? So with this particular system, we are not able to measure multipath. We're just looking at all the signals that come into the antenna at a sp specific amount of time. <clears throat> um, we did have a system that measured multipath. Um, it was a, what you call a sliding correlator that we tried using in a number of different measurements, but it was very sensitive to EMI. So you stepped on the gas and you saw the spectrum come up or the noise floor come up. So, uh, and it was very difficult to use. There's a certain range of speeds that you can use it with because it takes data at a certain time and then it slides the time base um, you can go read about it. I think it's on that website as well, but it was a very difficult system to use. And I haven't seen a good multipath system um, that actually will tell me, you know, when a signal comes into your antenna. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mark, you got a question? Yeah, I just, I had kind of had a question. I know you talked about, you know, some of the shared spectrum and so forth. And I know that well, there's been a lot of interest in the three gig spectrum, mm -hmm. you know, specifically some of the stuff for the CBRS and sharing yep. it with the military. Did yep. you get involved with with uh, any of that characterization <laughs> or recommendations for some of the monitoring stations? So uh, when you know when carriers go out and you know if you're away from San Diego, you can go ahead and get your grants and kind of work with part of that. Uh, with you know some of the specifications and making it work or just more to the point of that it may work uh, and we may be able to share it uh, you know how did that come about I know I, I you know see it in my job we you know we go out we get grants and you know there's stations around the coasts and stuff that uh, uh, you know will tell us hey if we can transmit or can't transmit on that particular channel so that's a really big subject let me take a drink real quick so we, we, can have, we can have the thumbnail view. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to try and make it as brief as possible. We did start making clutter measurements at three and a half gigahertz because or gigahertz or however you want to say it, um, <clears throat> because we saw this coming down the pike. It was becoming very apparent that uh, you know most of the population is on the east coast and the west coast. So. The wireless carriers needed that spectrum in order to um, fulfill their, um, gosh, I'm sorry, words escape me, but their economic base, right, to, to make a profit. And so um, we have a lot of scientists right now. In fact, um, one of the propagation models, the extended HADA model came out of ITS. Um, a lot of the wireless carriers didn't like that model. Um, but we had a lot to do on the front end with that CBRS stuff and a lot of negotiations. Um, <clears throat> a lot of that spectrum now is going to a, I think what they're trying to do is take a model um, and tell you if you can or cannot transmit, you know, at a certain time. Is the um, aircraft carrier coming in? And there is a report, I believe, on the website by Mike Cotton. He was very instrumental in measuring um, three and a half gigahertz spectrum from Navy ships um, to try and characterize what that signal looked like at San Diego and then at some points around the United States. So his measurements um, were very instrumental in trying to form some of that. And we still are involved in that. 
Um, we're getting a new contract with the DOD to actually go out and make more measurements. Actually, part of that contract is to do tropospheric measurements because you know, you, you might not see something close to shore, but it might be transmitted somewhere else in the, in, in the interior of the, the um, United States. So there's a big component on tropospheric measurements and measuring that. Um, ducting has been a very important topic in this particular CBRS band. Um, the Navy has been involved in this. Um, so we are probably going to be doing some clutter measurements um, just to firm up what they're saying is ground truth out there. There's a lot of trees out there. Your signal doesn't travel very far. For instance, we did measurements in Grand Junction and we sat on the top of I High Hill and Grand Junction is pretty rural and sparse. And I could go out for almost 50 kilometers with my signal and still measure it out to Fruta. Um, in when we went to North Carolina, I could only propagate a signal about four kilometers. It's very dense foliage. It's very lossy foliage. And so I think some of the predictions that they were making with their clutter measurements were just off, way off. And so I think we're getting involved in that. Um, there's other people working on it since I'm retiring. Um, but I think that ITS will play a big factor in that. The, the continuation of that for DOD. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Mark. I got some more questions. People are popping up here. So we're gonna keep you busy, Chris. Okay. Uh, it says lots of people worry about RF effects on health, cancer risks, etc. Cellular providers have sponsored many studies by respected health organizations. Do you get involved in that? Um, they did do a lot of experiments when I was at NIST. I didn't get involved with that. Um, if you guys have heard of an anechoic chamber or a, um, what am I thinking? They did measurements of, they took bottles of water that simulated rats and they packed them in to a cage and they injected RF signals into this environment. And they, they tried to see what the effects of that were, the health effects of that were. They also measured a lot of cellular emissions with a cell phone stuck next to one of those fake heads that you saw. And they tried to understand uh, how that signal impacted the head. I think that's why you have the, um, the now the earplug and the cell phones out away from you. Uh, I haven't been directly involved in that study, but there are a lot of RF limits. So I would not get next to my antenna, my transmitting antenna. Thank God it's 60 feet up, right? <laughs> um, but there are free space losses. So, and depending on your frequency, you can get pretty far or you can get pretty close at the higher frequencies. Um, but I would still be careful. Um, we don't know everything. And I think 5G, um, some people are really concerned about 5G just because it's very directional. The antennas are very directional and they're higher power. Um, I've heard estimates of 100 watts pumped out of those things. Um, and so I think studies need to be done on that and, and just be careful. Don't get close to one of those antennas. That's what I would say. I accidentally touched yeah, my antenna connection watts, time. Yeah, but the 100 watts is spread out over four or 800 megahertz, which is different than a narrow band carrier as well. Some, there are some um, signals down at three gigahertz though. Um, they are talking 5G down that low. And uh, there's a lot of these um, uh, cellular sites that are, I forgot what they call them. We, we did a whole bunch of measurements at the Atlanta stadium. Um, but small, they're cells. Very, small cells. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and so you have to be kind of uh, careful with those. I think they put them up high in that type of thing. But I, I haven't seen a lot of studies. So I still don't walk under those things. <laughs> Interesting to see what happens in the next uh, five to 10 years. Yeah, unfortunately, huh? Yeah. Um, do you have anything else, Mark, or to answer? 
and he had more comments as well. Oh, yeah. No. Okay. Uh, I have one comment says there's a company in Longmont that fires up song signal that someone was claiming interferes with well repeaters. And on top of that, do you know uh, or have any idea what might create noise in our VHF radios at city intersections? Oh, let's see. It's been a long time since I looked at the spectrum. Um, if you go into that report, I really, really tried to tell you everybody that uses that band um, is it um, is it a very narrow band like if you would go outside VHF would you see it or is it just concentrated in that well I, I think it's close to like our VHF repeater frequency okay. uh, 147270 uh, I, I know you go up and down 119 on occasions there's something that'll actually break the squelch on your radio as you're driving down wow. 119 um wow. usually at intersections and um it goes through longmont i've had it go you know all the way well there's not much after around sunset or well, after hover off of 119 so usually you know up to that point um and it, it i haven't had it all the time but it's, it's, it's been i've heard it and and the um doug was asking about it as well just, just curious to see if you might know hmm. or once you, you retire have if you're looking for something yeah. to do, we could use some help trying to find out what it is. Yeah, let's do some direction yeah. finding. I think yes. that would be fun. Yeah, that yeah, would be fun. Yeah, some of that, some of that is this the the poor quality of the receivers as well, and it's not if you take a spectrum that analyzer, it's not yeah. really a signal. The UHF is our UHF repeater. We're secondary users, and that's used for the weather profile profile layer off of Sunset right Nelson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, it would be fun to take a spectrum analyzer and go out and because I know um, we have we almost got a contract for um, the power line noise, you know, it came in and came out and um, they actually use that noise to tell them which ones they need which transformers they need to replace or which lines they need to replace so it's, it's very interesting work. Yeah. Mechanical love... companies actually have a signal on and they just basically have a, de a detuned receiver that they drive yeah. around with in their truck. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. I love radio science. I just don't like working for the government anymore. So. <laughs> well, well, welcome to Ham Radio. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, one of the comment we had says a lot of junctions now have traffic cameras that are radio linked. Uh, we're not quite sure what the band is, but that's potentially maybe possibly some of the interference. Yeah, it could. I mean, it could be depending on the frequency. Um, I know that the um, government had surveillance uh, instrumentation in the 1755 to 1780 megahertz band. And I think they had to move that. And I'm not sure exactly where they moved it. But I mean, we could maybe we could go look. Um, you know, we have the government master file and uh, that's not open to the public. It's kind of like the FCC licensing database, but for government. And it'll often tell you um, how wide the signal is, where it's located. Um, that same thing is the if you go into the licensing database for the FCC, it'll give you that same information. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, I, and, and again, welcome to the hobby and, and thank you for this presentation. I mean, it's been very... Sure. I, for some people, it might be a little bit, um, I don't want to say over their heads, but kind of maybe not quite understand it, especially for some, some newer hams. But, uh, you know, I, I think you did a really good job of explaining a lot of the stuff. And it makes sense to me now because I was sitting there thinking for a while, OK, what is she really talking about? And then you yeah. explained it. So I, I appreciate that because it uh, definitely was a very great presentation. Uh, you know, Kat says, excellent presentation. Thank you, Chris. Good. Um, so, you know, and. And we know, you know, because our repeater just at the Justice Center mm -hmm. for, the, for the for the club. You know, mm -hmm. we know Longmont's kind of um, in a little bit of a valley. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, so you know, we we I know we've worked on different ways because North Longmont sometimes can't even hit our repeaters. Uh, I'm on Firestone; I can hit it just fine. But I also try to get my antennas up at least twelve to sixteen feet. You know, something like that. Yeah. So. I'm in Broomfield and um, I can't hit your repeater 
all the time. Sometimes I can hit it, sometimes I can't. Uh, but I was thinking it might, it would be interesting to just take my radio and just find out, ex you know, find a radius exactly where I could use it. And right now I just have a bow thing. Um, but it's very interesting work to me just to, you know, try and see where that signal propagates. Right. And we've had and some people in mind, Broomfield. Yeah, ahead, keep in mind that we've got voting receivers on uh, a repeater as well. So you can sometimes get into it because we've, I've got a receiver up on a hill outside of Boulder. Uh, yep. But right now, because of some inner mod, uh, we're not running the transmitter up there because we have the ability to turn on one of the other transmitters. Okay. And there's a couple of people in Broomfield. I can't remember. There's a hill out there. I want to say on the west side of town that people have gone driven to the hill. I guess there's a park out there and actually hit the repeaters. Okay. And join and used to join some of the nets. Yeah. Sometimes so I can hear you and I can't um, I can't speak. So right. it's kind of a fine line. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the other question is forget another way, well. another way to uh, join in with the lark net is through uh echo link which has a a pretty nice uh phone yeah app. i've done that yep i have an echo link so yeah yeah i've done i've done that as well when i uh was kind of on the fringes of reception and, and chris are you coming in vhf or uhf or have you tried both i've tried both okay yeah. Okay. Yep. And then I had another comment here. Ed was commenting and says, I have some evidence that Lark signal suffers from intermod resulting from some of the mountaintop high power repeaters oh, and wow. or 150 megahertz stuff. Mm -hmm. Also, there's a 147.27 in Colorado Springs. They wow. think sometimes yeah. might reach Longmont. Uh, and then we had another a question is, uh, what's your education for this career? Uh, so I got my bachelor's degree in physics. And I got a job at NIST and I found out that I couldn't talk to the electronics engineers because they didn't understand physics. So I went back and I got my electronics um, degree, electrical engineering degree at CU, uh, just my master's so that I could talk to them. And I didn't do a thesis, I just did coursework. And a lot of that was at the um, quantum level. I really, I'm interested in, the physics more than the electrical engineering stuff. So that's kind of the trajectory that I took. And then I just ended up at NIST and I just continued on there. And, you know, it, it was kind of like, it just happened. So, Good. but it's been Thank fun. I've, I've done a lot of stuff. It's been really, really interesting. I learned a lot of things, so. Um. One another question is how difficult was it for you to get your amateur license with all that training? It wasn't that difficult. I did go through thank thank you for your website because I went through <laughs> all your books and all your stuff. And um, I knew the basic concepts. Uh, I had a little more trouble on the general license. The technician license wasn't too bad. I think I missed a few questions. Uh, but I I I just went through the books and because of the understanding of, you know, my electrical engineering degree, I didn't really have a big problem. Just kind of studied. Good. Again, welcome to the hobby. Thank you for presenting to the club. Uh, you know, even uh, again, another thank you for a great presentation. Very interesting and informative. Um, you know, even if you, you know, can't get out to Longmont and join our club. There's other clubs in the Denver area as well. I, you know, I recommend getting involved with clubs. Yeah. Um, yep. Especially if you want to help and you, you're retired and you got time. I know Arm Ham's always looking for help. Okay. <laughs> so are we, uh, yeah. you know, we're always looking for help and um, finding things because I know Longmont is, you know, like a lot of places in Colorado is growing. Yes. New buildings and things coming up all the time. So there's yep. new interference. There's all kinds yep. of things going on that, uh, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, when you do retire, if, if you've got the time, you're willing to do it, we may, you know, say, hey, Chris, uh, we got some interference where you want to kind of help track it down and see if we can figure out what it is. And I'd absolutely you know, have some love to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I haven't built a lot of antennas, but I did a lot of antenna modeling. So I kind of understand kind of the characteristics and the, um, you know, 
antenna directions and stuff. So it would be very interesting for me to see it actually used in the field. It would be very well, interesting. Me and Brian, ASOW, actually built, well, I built, and we went out and tested one day, a UHF and VHF uh, tape measure antennas. Oh, fun. And we, yeah. and we used awesome. them for satellite communications. Yeah. So we, we didn't make any contacts, but we did hear the satellites. Uh, a lot of kind wow. Of, unfortunately, with satellites, though, unless you got the right amount of power and you get through, it's, you yeah. know, um, you yep. know it's pile up. Um, another comment was says, uh, I bet Chris would be very good on a fox hunt. So yeah. I'm sure you'd be really good. And we did one in April. Uh, the clubs, I, as a club president, I'm trying to get more of that type of stuff going. Uh, summer's been kind of busy for me. Um, yeah. My son's been in town visiting and other things. So I'm hoping in the spring and things like that, we'll maybe kick up fox hunts again. Uh, the first fox hunt we did in April, um, it was your W and myself sat out at the uh, Greenway in Longmont and uh, we did SSTV. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, fox I remember hunt. So that. We, yeah. So we yeah. had a, a good time with that. And, um, you know, I like to do things different, think outside the box. We're trying to find new things. One day I might just go throw a transmitter out somewhere and said, okay, go find it. Send me a picture and let me know when you found it. Yeah. But I, I might do that one day. I just haven't done it yet. I got to get the time and between trying to do the potos and everything else it, uh, and working. Yeah. Cause unfortunately I still work full time. I'd love to be retired and I'd be doing all kinds of stuff, but uh, oh, that's know. just not here yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a lot of things that have just happened that got in the way, but I'm hoping maybe things will settle down after, you know, after I retire and I can really get into this and um, I'd like to make a Morse code I think that would be great. I love woodworking. So I, I think that would be awesome. I so. actually found specs today for a 20 meter antenna that you can build for under $30. Wow. Um, and it, there's some woodworking involved. Well, just cutting some pieces of wood and running up wires and, and things like that. And you can take it apart into four foot sections and oh. take it with you for a two beam, um, uh, 20 meter antenna. So I, that's something I'm looking at is getting more into building antennas. We had Ed Fong back in January. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Ed. His students build antennas out on the east, on the west coast, on California, oh. and sell them. And uh, the proceeds go to support his his kids. And uh, the club made a big purchase of that. Uh, we're doing another one. Uh, the link should be on the website if you would like to order one because uh, okay. we get a little bit better price on them. I'm hoping okay. to put another order together here soon and send it to them. But uh, he, he makes a two meter uh, yeah, dual band. He also makes a tri band. Wow. Uh, and then he does a J pole, a roll up J pole. Um, he's got some accessories there, but they're really neat. And they just go in PVC and they're vertical. No yeah, ground riddles, need anything else. And I actually use that on the Tuesday night net here at my house. Okay. So um, one thing I learned is, you know, it's amazing what will receive and resonate a certain frequency attach yeah. a wire and some coax and see what happens we used to make um we made an antenna that sat on a ground plane it was made out of copper and we found that if we used a metallic fibrous material that we could get a good connection between that and the ground plane and reduce the um, reflection that you get off the front edge of that antenna oh. so we did a lot of that um, we called them uh, TEM antennas, and it was a transverse electric ma electric magnetic mode, but they were very, very sensitive. Um, I think I still have that report out there somewhere. At, that one's at NIST, but that was a lot of fun. We did a lot of work with that. Nice. Yeah, I, I'm, I know a lot of us are, live in HOA, so we're kind of restricted on antennas. <laughs> yeah, we need to... We need to find something that looks like a tree, huh? Well, uh, to be honest, <laughs> like I told the club and everybody in the club knows this, I'm the type of person that rather asks for uh, forgiveness than permission. Yeah. Uh, so I have a, 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 a what they call an octopus system. It's a four oh. band uh, dipole, uh, hamstick dipole system up 16 feet in my backyard. So my neighbors wow. haven't complained yet. And it's on That's good. Port portable mass. So I just tell them, oh, it's, on, it's not permanent. So I can take it down anytime. Yeah. But, uh, I keep it up all well, the time. You should tell them, you know what? Someday I may save your life. You better not complain. Yeah, well, that's why they haven't said anything. Well, the guy behind me works for IBM. Uh, neighbor to one side's uh, brother is a ham. The other guy is ex-army. So yeah, I, my neighbors yeah. are pretty cool. That's awesome. So, all right. Does anybody else have any more questions, comments? Anything they'd well, like to mention to Chris? 
Kat does have my email address. So you guys, if something comes up, you want some more explanation, let me know. Um, if you have trouble finding the reports, let me know. Okay. Um, I can help you or I can send them out or whatever. And another comment, really interesting presentation. Thank you. So yes, mm -hmm. club appreciates it. And uh, hopefully you can attend some of our meetings you'd like. And if you join, that's great. If you don't, I don't know if you remember or not, but- uh, I am a member, yeah. Oh, I am oh, a thank member. You. I just have no well. time, yep. <laughs> that's okay so you get all the newsletters you know everything that's going on i do yep i do so, and as you as you know you know the club is uh i try to keep us as active as possible yeah um, but but i know life gets in the way too so that's yeah this year's been really bad so yeah so and and i'm hoping 2022 is going to be a good thing especially with the solar cycle starting to go up a little bit as well yeah with propagation yeah. and hf I, I know that's that's gotten a little better you know i i made a um, 17 meter contact the other day on FT8 with only, I think it was 10 watts wow. or less to the East Coast. So that's awesome. I'd or love the, to do a moon bounce one time. I think that would be pretty cool. I just know somebody that's got a uh, amplifier big enough to do a moon bounce. That yeah. would be cool. <laughs> I think one of my colleagues did it, but I don't know if he did it from work or home. <laughs> so do you guys have a 1500? Uh, or, or or, well, I guess that's another question. Are you limited on your power for like amateur radio is 1500 PEP, uh, but are you limited? Yeah, absolutely. We have to put in what's called a special temporary authority. And we have to, right now I'm just limited by the amplifier that I have. And it, um, it just depends on where we transmit. And so they'll tell us, you know, you can't, go above this level. There's a, a red book. I don't know if you guys know about that, but it has all of the, the regulations on in what band and how much you can, how much power you can transmit and what radius you can transmit. Um, that's on the NTIA side. We have to follow that regulation book. Okay. Oh, and somebody was making a comment about six active regions on the visible disc today. F10.7 mm -hmm. was 94 for, it was off the uh, NOAA website for sunspots, so. Wow. The sun's getting a little active. Good. So Good hopefully stuff. you'll get on HF and make some yeah. contacts as well. Yeah. All right, does anybody have anything else? Any questions, comments? Again, Chris, thank you very much. Appreciate sure. it. Sure. Um, I always like I, seeing what other people are doing. So I thought you guys might be interested since you are all into radio and you kind of understand this stuff. So, okay. Oh, so this was actually brought to you by Rob, AD0U, currently working a shift at the Space Weather Prediction Center. Well, thank you, Rob. That was that, that, was that Sunspot report that he just said. And he's got a link in the uh, chat to everybody if you'd like to click on it. So, oh, he's got no microphone there. Well, thank you, Rob, for joining us. And, uh, in that information. So if you check your chat, uh, Rob's got a link in there for Sunspot Group. So check it out. All right. Well, if nobody's got anything else, then I want to thank everybody again for joining this evening. As always, um, you know, we'll try to keep up and uh, keep the emails going. And uh, next month, the plan is, if I can pull it off, uh, we will actually meet in person next month if you can make it. If not, we'll also have a Zoom call. It'll be a hybrid. Um, I'm still in kind of saying what we want to do because unfortunately 350 Terry Street that room that we used to have on the first floor we no longer have access to so um, there's been some changes there the room we can get probably 35 40 people a little tight definitely cooler than the uh, the Clover building at the fairgrounds but uh, debating to see if I can maybe get something better or if we try to do something else but uh, keep an eye out on the website and emails for that and the splatter which will be coming out in the next day or two, hopefully. As Kat says, she's going to work on her best to get it out. And again, POTA again this weekend. So if you have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to say uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. 73, and we will uh, up and we will uh, talk to you again next month. Thank you, everyone. The lo locals who have been here for a long time like to depart because it's it's too crazy. Well, yeah, I would. So it's our first one. So we're going Saturday. I, I'm volunteering in the parade on Saturday.
I'm on my radio. We're using DMR, by the way. And then uh, Saturday afternoon, we have a rodeo on Saturday night. We go see Thomas Rhett. Busy nice. day. There are four parades. Saturday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. So if you mm. can make one of those. It, uh, oh. The, the, uh, the Boulder County Fair Parade is sort of a mini version of a parade. Well, yeah, compared to Frontier Days. Yeah. Anyway, should be lots of fun. Everybody's well, invited. Stay safe up there, and hopefully nobody comes in and ruins it for everybody else. So. Well, that's, we've got uh, 20 of us out on the radios. The parade's Good. about what, two miles long or something. It's, it's a big parade. Dale's so, ready. He's got his hat. About the Ham Fest, October, I think it is. October 9th. The Wyoming Ham Convention here in uh, Cheyenne. So there'll be more information coming. You all come. It's going to be the only in-person thing this year, as far as I can tell. So the clubs up there are mobilizing to get it going? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Cheyenne is tasked with uh, Chiwai. The Chiwai Amateur Radio Club is tasked with putting the ham convention on. I'm responsible for prizes. I better damn well get busy. Hey, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Save Brian. one for me. <laughs> thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian and Chuck. <laughs> maybe hey, I'll welcome. just maybe I'll just write you a check and buy all the prizes you guys got. <laughs> uh, we'll see. We can we can bring it up to the board and see what they think. So <laughs> that'd be a lot easier for me. <laughs> maybe harder for us though in April because I don't know when new stuff's coming out because of the all, everybody's uh, back ordered on everything. Yeah, I don't know. I haven't I haven't I haven't done enough yet. So we'll see. Yeah. There's a lot of, it depends on what your budget is. There's a lot of stuff out there. So, all right, I got 702. So let's get started really quick. Um, 